Thank you, colleagues. We start business this afternoon with First Minister's questions. And before we turn to the questions, can I invite the First Minister to update Parliament on the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, thanks, President Officer. I'll give a quick update on today's statistics. 803 new cases were reported yesterday. That's 4.8 per cent of all the tests carried out, and the total number of cases now stands at 188,345. Uh, currently, there are 1,542 people in hospital. That is 76 fewer than yesterday. And that is now just 22 above the peak of last spring, which is positive. 113 people who have tested positive for COVID or been admitted to hospital with COVID within the last 28 days are currently in intensive care. That's one more than yesterday. Now, I deliberately gave that definition uh, there because that is the standard measure we have been using for our daily intensive care figures. But that uh, definition doesn't cover some patients uh, 30 as of today who have been in intensive care with COVID now for more than 28 days. Uh, the number of COVID patients experiencing long stays in ICU is now increasing and therefore from today we will be publishing data on this additional measure. I also regret to report that in the past 24 hours a further 50 deaths were registered of patients who first tested positive in the past 28 days and the total number of people who have died uh, under the daily measurement we use is now 6,551. National Records of Scotland has also just published its weekly update. Uh, that includes cases where COVID is a suspected or contributory cause of death. And today's update shows that by Sunday, the total number of registered deaths linked to COVID under that wider definition was 8,726. 374 of those deaths were registered last week. That is 70 fewer than in the previous week. Uh, once again, I want to take this opportunity to send my condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one. Uh, let me also quickly update Parliament on the latest vaccination figures. As of 8.30 this morning, uh, 985,569 people have uh, received their first dose of the vaccine. That is an increase of 57,447 since yesterday. Uh, that's the second highest daily total so far, uh, which given the severe weather conditions yesterday is in my view, nothing short of extraordinary. And my thanks go to everyone who made it happen, those running the programme across the country, and of course, those braving the elements to get the jag. Uh, we've now vaccinated with the first dose 99.8% of residents in older people's care homes. Uh, at least 96% of people over 80 living in the community have also now had the first dose, together with 80% of 75 to 79 year olds and 45% of those aged 70 to 74. Uh, we remain on course to vaccinate everyone over 70 and all people with a serious clinical vulnerability by mid-February. And we're also now accelerating the vaccination of 65 to 69 year olds. Presiding officer, vaccination will in time offer us a route back to greater normality. However, we know it must be accompanied by other measures. That's why this week we have confirmed further steps to increase testing and also why we are adopting strict travel restrictions. Michael Matheson announced yesterday that from Monday, all travellers to Scotland from outside the common travel area will be required to undergo managed quarantine. And for the moment, alongside vaccination testing and travel restrictions, lockdown continues to be the most important way we have of keeping the virus under control. These restrictions are tough for all of us, but they are working. So let me end by repeating the most important rule of all. Please stay at home except for essential purposes. And when you are out, remember the facts advice. But please uh, stay at home whenever possible. It remains essential to getting and keeping the virus under control as we vaccinate more and more people. So please stick with it, stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives. Thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to turn to questions. I would uh, encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak button. And I call on Ruth Davison. Thank you, Presiding Officer. SNP Chief Executive Peter Murrell may have committed perjury by changing his story under oath to a committee inquiry of this Parliament. But he has been very clear about one thing. Nicola Sturgeon didn't discuss the Alex Salmon meetings with him as her party chief executive. It's just about the only thing he's given a straight answer on. He was certain that the meetings were government business. Did Peter Murrell tell the truth under oath? 
First Minister. Uh, yes, he uh, did tell the truth. Uh, of course, he's perfectly capable of standing up for himself. He doesn't uh, need me to do it. I'll get my opportunity, of course, uh, to set out uh, my account to the committee, uh, assuming the committee doesn't postpone it again next Tuesday, and I relish that opportunity. It's perhaps clear uh, to everyone uh, why uh, the opposition parties uh, are so keen uh, to drag Peter Murrow uh, into a process that he had no part in and to try to damage him. Perhaps they know how integral he's been over the past 15 years to the electoral success of the SNP and conversely to the electoral defeats uh, of their parties. So perhaps uh, that motive is very, very transparent indeed. Officer, the First Minister said yes there, but the SNP Chief Executive evidence conflicts with the First Minister's and only one can be right. And there is a pattern here of a ruling party of government acting beyond reproach, a Chief Executive changing his story, a suddenly forgetful First Minister, votes of Parliament ignored and promises of cooperation broken. Officials coached at taxpayers' expense, forced to change their evidence, lawyers shutting down key witnesses and statement. This parliament, this country shouldn't have to put up with this. So today I'm sharing evidence that the committee won't publish. Evidence that's been shut down, even though it's already in the public domain. The First Minister doesn't need to wait for her committee appearance to answer these questions because the committee won't publish the evidence anyway. Alex Salmond says that the First Minister set up a meeting on the 14th of July in her home and that after that she called him on the 18th of July to discuss the ongoing situation. Did the Permanent Secretary know about those meetings before they happened? First Minister. Um, I have set out uh, an account of the dates on which I spoke to Alex Salmond in person and on the telephone already in my written evidence. I told uh, the Permanent Secretary uh, that these meetings had happened. I have told uh, the committee in written evidence uh, when all of that happened. And I will go into all of that in detail on oath before the committee next week. That is the right and proper way to do this. Um, I want to sit in front of the committee. I have had accusations levelled at me uh, now for, what, two years? Um, I have not been able to answer those fully, firstly because of ongoing criminal proceedings and latterly out of respect to the process of this committee. It is not me that is refusing to sit in front of the committee. I am relishing the prospect of doing that. And then people can hear my account uh, and they can make up their own minds. In the meantime, I will go on with doing the job the people across this country want me to do, which is to get on with leading this country through a pandemic. Ms. Davison. Well, if you pick your way through that answer, it sounds as if she only informed the Permanent Secretary after the meeting and after the phone call. So let's get the story straight. In everyone else's mind, including Peter Murrell's, this was always a government matter. But according to the First Minister's story, it only became a government matter on the 6th of June, when she wrote to the Permanent Secretary that she knew about the investigation. So on the 6th of June, this became, to the First Minister's mind, a government matter. And being a government matter, she then, a month later, set up a meeting with Alex Salmond in her house on the 14th of July. And then she called him four days later. All of this on a government matter, all without an official present, all without a record taken, and all against the ministerial code. So let me ask the First Minister, if she knew that this was government business on the 6th of June, why did she set up these July meetings and phone calls without an official present and without a record taken? You see, Ruth Davison, uh, I think she did a moment ago, say, I'm going to reveal evidence that uh, nobody will otherwise hear. Everything that she's just said, to the, uh, as far as I can uh, recall it, and people can check on my written evidence, is all set out in the written evidence that I've already given to the committee. That's published. That's been published for months. I've been patiently waiting now to give oral evidence to the committee. I think my uh, date to do that, and I understand the reasons why, has been postponed certainly two, perhaps three times. And I certainly hope to be sitting in front of the committee answering all of these questions on oath uh, next Tuesday morning. And people can listen to that and they can make up their own minds. Because I believe it is important uh, to subject myself to scrutiny, uh, to make sure the government is subjected to scrutiny, but also to have the opportunity to take head on some of the ridiculous conspiracy theories that people like Ruth Davidson, in my view, have been uh, all too quick to want to indulge. Uh, and I call on anybody who's got anything to help with the process of this committee to sit 
before that committee and do what I am going to do and put an account on the record on oath, uh, because I'm not the one who is refusing to do that. Uh, all of my meetings, uh, as I've said before, were in my capacity uh, as party leader. I will say that again uh, orally. Um, I informed the Permanent Secretary uh, in June when I thought uh, the government was going to be subjected to legal challenge. I've made uh, all of that clear. And all along, uh, I was determined uh, that I would do nothing to intervene in or compromise the confidentiality and the independence and the integrity of a process that was kicked off because women, whose voice, frankly, has been too often lost in this whole process, because women came forward with complaints. Um, and I thought it was important that they got properly investigated uh, and not swept under the carpet just because uh, of the seniority and the party affiliation of who those complaints were about. Uh, so I'll set out my account openly uh, and fully, and I relish at long last to have the opportunity to do it. Ruth Davison. Rising officer, these women were failed. They were failed by the system that was set up by her government. And while they were being failed, the First Minister knew exactly what she was meeting Alex Salmond about. And she told not to, chose not to tell her officials in advance. And she chose not to keep a record. And she kept speaking to Alex Salmond all throughout this process, throughout this process that failed all of these women. And then she came into this chamber and she told Parliament things that utterly contradicted by her own evidence and testimony. So we have failed women, taxpayers' money and a cover-up at the heart of government. And this whole affair stinks to high heaven. And someone should take responsibility for these failings. Shouldn't it be you, First Minister? First Minister. Well, in terms of the government uh, and in terms of my role as First Minister, the scrutiny is right and proper, which I, is why I am freely uh, subjecting myself to that scrutiny. That is right and proper. I've waited a long time to get the opportunity to do it next Tuesday, and I now relish uh, that opportunity. What I think is very clear, certainly been clear from Ruth Davidson and uh, may I say it has been clear, I think, from some members of the committee that actually it doesn't matter to them what I say next Tuesday. It doesn't matter what any of us say before the committee because they've prejudged the issues. Uh, they have decided in advance uh, what the rights and wrongs of this are. The roots of this whole issue are in complaints that came forward, uh, not about my behaviour, but about somebody else's behaviour. And it was right uh, that those were properly investigated. We know, because this is why the judicial review action uh, collapsed in the way it did, that the government made a mistake in applying the procedure. And I deeply regret that, because I think that did let down women. But any process now that is indulging conspiracy theories uh, without insisting uh, that people come before the committee uh, to substantiate those uh, theories, in my view, also lets down uh, the women. So uh, the scrutiny of me and my government is right and proper, and I do not shy away from that. On the contrary, I've been waiting a long time to sit before the committee and face up to that. There's also, of course, uh, another process ongoing into whether, or as I would say, not uh, I breached the ministerial code. Um, and it's important to allow that to take its course as well. Uh, but I say again, presiding officer, it really does feel to me as if there are certain people in this chamber who have already prejudged all of this and are not interested in what I uh, or anybody else have to say about it. Question two, Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, presiding officer. As a member of the committee on the Scottish Government handling of harassment complaints, I will not prejudge the outcome before the First Minister gives evidence next week, and she knows I'm not a great believer in conspiracy theories. But it does appear that the government procedures were deeply flawed and that two women were let down by the process, which I think we would all agree we must ensure never happens again. Can I say to her, though, the First Minister knows, and she's just referenced it, that she, she is subject to a referral for a potential breach of the Ministerial Code being investigated by James Hamilton QC. The Ministerial Code exists to protect the public interest, to ensure that there is trust between politicians and the public, and for the public to hold the government to account. It is therefore critically important. Can I therefore ask her if she is found to have breached the Ministerial Code, Will she resign? First minister. This is the Jackie Bailey that's not prejudging the outcome <laughs> of these. I tell you what, when, 
when we have the outcomes of the committee process, and let me say on the committee process, and there have been women involved in this uh, who have, uh, I, I know because it's published, written to the committee saying that they think the committee process is now letting them down as well. And I think it's important not to lose sight of that. So when the committee has concluded its work, and I still hope the committee will perhaps use the powers that are available to it to ensure that everybody relevant sits before this committee and gives evidence, uh, but that's a matter for the committee and for Jackie Bailey. Uh, but when the committee has reported and when James Hamilton, again, I'm fully, uh, as I am obliged to do, cooperating with that inquiry, uh, when the outcomes of those are published, then people can ask me then and I can set out what I intend to do. Uh, but I do not believe I breached the ministerial code and that um, is my position right now. And I think I'm entitled to due process just like everybody else. Jackie Bailey. Um, can I say to the First Minister, I'm not prejudging the outcome of the Ministerial Code. I asked her if she had breached it, what action she would, she, would she take? I'm neither asking her about the committee. So the First Minister cannot simply ignore the Ministerial Code. That would have deeply damaging consequences to this Parliament, to the Government and to our democracy. So let me ask her, on the 29th of March 2018, the First Minister attended a meeting here in Parliament with Jeff Aberdeen, the former Chief of Staff, to Alex Salmond. The First Minister claimed to have forgotten about that meeting and told the Parliament that the meeting was fleeting or opportunistic. But it was the case that the meeting was pre-arranged and for the specific purpose of discussing the complaints made against Alex Salmond. Can I remind the First Minister of paragraph 1.2, section C of the Ministerial Code, which says it is of paramount importance that ministers give accurate and truthful information to the Parliament, correcting any inadvertent error at the earliest opportunities. Ministers who knowingly mislead the Parliament will be expected to offer their resignation. So I ask again, if the First Minister is found to have breached the Ministerial Code, Will she resign? First Minister. Uh, I don't believe I did breach the ministerial code and therefore I'm not going to engage on the hypothetical. When James Hamilton issues his report, we can have an open discussion on the basis of whatever findings uh, he arrives at, just as we will no doubt have an open discussion when the committee arrives at whatever findings it arrives at. I, I do think uh, Jackie Bailey is really stretching it here to say she's not prejudging things and then ask me a string of questions exactly uh, designed to prejudge uh, the outcome of this. Now, all of these issues that she has uh, raised here, she will get the opportunity in proper full session, uh, not just with selective bits of it, but in the whole uh, course of this, to ask me whatever question she chooses to on Tuesday. I look forward to having that opportunity and we'll do that properly. I think that is the best way to ensure full scrutiny of me and my government. I think that is the best way to try to respect uh, the, the rights and the interests of the women whose complaints started uh, this whole process. And actually, it's also the best way to allow me due process, which I uh, am entitled to as well. So I look forward to this opportunity. Uh, and I say again, I think if the committee is really interested in having uh, proper, full transparency, then it will be ensuring that everybody who has got uh, relevant information to offer here uh, is before that committee and doing that fully, openly, on the record and on oath, just as I will do on Tuesday. Jackie Bailey. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Every time I ask a question about the Ministerial Code investigation, the First Minister replies with rhetoric about the committee. And I look forward to questioning her on Tuesday at the committee. But my questions are specific to the Ministerial Code investigation that's being conducted by James Hamilton QC. And it isn't just over a question of whether Parliament has been misled that the First Minister should be investigated. Section 2.30 of the Ministerial Code says, and I quote, Ministers and officials should therefore ensure that their decisions are informed by the appropriate analysis of the legal considerations and that the legal implications of any course of action are considered at the earliest opportunity. We know in the judicial review that there was a significant delay between counsel's opinion and the conceding of the case, and it took the threat of senior counsel to resign before the government collapsed the judicial review, costing the taxpayer well over £600,000. So I ask again, if the First Minister is found to have breached the ministerial code, will she resign? First Minister. 
Look, Jackie Bailey stands up here and says she's not prejudging the outcome of things in one breath, but in the next breath she says we know things. Before the committee has even heard a single word in oral session from me. So I think Jackie Bailey should really decide whether she's open-minded, objective and impartial on this uh, or whether uh, she has prejudged. I, I suspect that for Jackie Bailey and some on the Conservatives, uh, it doesn't matter what I say on Tuesday, the press releases will already be written, uh, just as I suspect they were before uh, my husband appeared uh, for the second time earlier this week. But on the Ministerial Code, I'm well aware of the terms of the Ministerial Code, probably more aware uh, than Jackie Bailey is. I do not consider that I breached the Ministerial Code. I uh, will make that case uh, very, very robustly. Um, and then we will see what the findings of James Hamilton are uh, and when those findings are arrived at and when those findings are published remember it was me that referred myself to uh, James Hamilton for uh, this inquiry uh, so let's wait and see what those findings are and then we can have all of these discussions uh, but let's not prejudge the outcome of this I know why uh, the opposition are desperate to get rid of me I'm under no illusions about that. But I, just like everybody else, I'm entitled to due process. Uh, and I don't, need, I don't need lectures from Jackie Bailey on democracy. Uh, care home residents have been separated from their families for months, just when they needed each other most. I've had detailed and helpful discussions with the health secretary and the chief nursing officer on how to allow safe visiting. So now that almost all the care home residents have been vaccinated, will their families be allowed in soon? Will it be possible to allow safe visiting by, say, the middle of February, when immunity takes hold? First Minister. Um, I very much hope that we can reach that position um, soon, uh, but I, just as I have uh, tried to avoid doing in the past, I've tried to refrain from giving simplistic or easy answers, even if I know they are the answers everybody wants to hear. There is new guidance on care home uh, visiting that has been worked on right now. It will be published imminently. I don't think we've got a precise date for it yet, but it will be published imminently. And it is looking in light of uh, the, the current rates and levels of the virus and also, of course, in light of the extremely high uptake of vaccination in care homes, uh, what is possible in terms of designated visitors that can have much greater normality in their interactions with care home residents. Uh, of all the really, really difficult things uh, that people are having to live with as a result of this pandemic, I know that this is one of the most difficult. People who are separated from older relatives, generally people who are separated from older relatives and can't have normal interaction, but that is particularly difficult and cruel, I think, for people whose uh, older relatives are residents in care homes. We want to get to a much better position as quickly as possible, but we must do that carefully and we must do that in a way that prioritises the safety of those residents and everybody who works uh, in a care home environment. Um, I, uh, remembering, because I will never for as long as I live forget uh, the, the toll uh, of deaths in our care homes last year. There are still people dying in our care homes from COVID, although at lower numbers than last year. I don't want us ever to go back to that position, which is why these decisions have to be taken so carefully. Willie Rennie. Uh, I'm pleased that the First Minister indicates that it might happen soon, and I'm also pleased that there will be new guidance. But considering Many of them don't have much time left. Every single day does count. Anne has early onset dementia. Her daughter said, I find it absolutely awful thinking what is going through her head just now. That those faces she used to know, visiting her all the time, are no longer there. Families are giving evidence to Parliament today. Families are crying out for urgent change. We've heard their voices. They do want that safe access. Clinicians say that separation is worsening dementia as visits from their family are the only tether to reality that some people have left. Residents in care homes should be living, not just existing. So can I press the First Minister just a little bit more? Can she give families hope? And can she give them some date as to when safe home visiting will begin. First Minister. Uh, look, I'm not going to give a date today before we're in a position to do that. I, I think that would be wrong because 
that would be uh, running the risk of giving families false hope. And I, I don't want to do that. When we get to that position, and I hope that will be sooner rather than later, I want that to be on the basis of well-considered uh, advice and guidance that has been properly uh, informed by clinical uh, evidence and clinical input, and so that when we are giving a date, that is a date that we can have some confidence in. I, I take two things to people. I don't expect either of them to make a single person who's in this scenario feel any better, because uh, I don't underestimate for a second how deeply traumatic this is. But the first thing I would say is I know how deeply traumatic it is, or at least I can imagine. So, you know, I, I don't need, I'm, I'm not, this is not a criticism of Willie Rennie reading out that kind of testimony. I know this, I feel this. Uh, my heart breaks for people in this position. And the second thing is what possible interest would I have or the health secretary have for delaying a minute longer than necessary a return to normality? We all want to get back to normality generally as quickly as possible, but particularly back to normality on these things that matter so deeply to all of us. So we will do this as quickly as possible, but it is incumbent on me and the Health Secretary to do it as safely as possible so that we're not standing here later this year uh, having discussions across this chamber about why we've got more people dying in our care homes again from COVID. So these are difficult decisions. They are, the difficulty of the decisions are as nothing compared to the difficulty of the reality relatives are living with. But I would urge people to try to understand the reasons why this has to be done as carefully as we are trying to do it. Thank you. Question for Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister knows, the Scottish Greens have made the case for greater protection for people renting their home through the pandemic. It was green pressure that led to the introduction and extension of the winter eviction ban and the introduction of the Tenants' Hardship Fund. And it was a green amendment to emergency legislation which gave students the right to terminate their tenancies. But there's still more to do. What's missing is serious action to tackle out-of-control rent rises. Does the First Minister accept that the idea of rent pressure zones has failed, given that there isn't a single such zone operating anywhere in Scotland? And what more does she plan to do to tackle rising rents and prevent people in the private rented sector from building up unmanageable debt? First Minister. Um, I wouldn't uh, necessarily accept that the legislation that was put in place, including rent pressure zones, uh, has been as Patrick Harvey characterises it. The, uh, onus um, and, and the flexibility is on local authorities, of course, to, to take action where uh, they consider it uh, necessary and appropriate to do. Uh, but I do accept there is more we can do on this front. Uh, Patrick Harvey has run through the, the various steps the government has taken. Uh, I'm sure I'm happy to give him and the Greens due credit for that, but I'm sure he'd also give the government credit. I hope he'd give the government credit for being very responsive uh, to where action in the, the face of the pandemic has been necessary. And I don't close my mind and the government uh, doesn't close its mind to doing more here, um, not just in the short term of the pandemic, but looking longer term about how we better uh, regulate the, the private rented sector and legislation, I think, uh, by necessity, would uh, require to be in the new session of Parliament after the election. And my party, as I'm sure his and others will, will put forward proposals for that in the course of the election. And it may be that we can find some parliamentary consensus on what uh, needs done. Uh, so I'm open minded and will consider to listen to proposals both in the short term, but also for the longer term. Patrick Harvey. I do give credit when the government listens and acts, but that hasn't happened on the issue of rent controls. And high rent is just one factor, keeping many households in poverty. As we look forward to recovery from the pandemic, there are stark warnings about the future increases in poverty that our country may see. The Scottish Government has got eye-catching targets on child poverty, but even before the pandemic, we were on track to miss them. Almost one in four children in this country live in poverty, and if we don't act, this will rise dramatically. Citizens Advice Scotland has warned about rising debt. Homeschooling has increased household costs for many people. Incomes are under threat, and the UK, UK social security system is still unworthy of the name. Surely the Scottish Government needs to show more ambition, both in its budget for next year and in the longer term, to support household incomes of those most in need. 
whether that means expanding free transport and school meals, investing to cut energy bills, reconsidering its position on public sector pay, or providing an uplift on the Scottish child payment. There are many actions that need to be taken to support the household incomes of those most in need. First Minister. Um, I very much agree with the sentiments of that, but it's not true to say that the Scottish Government just has eye-catching targets on child poverty. We have, and I'll use this term because it's the one used by anti-child poverty campaigners, we have game-changing policies in place. The new Scottish Child Payment just taking effect now to put extra money into the pockets of low-income families with children. My party has already set out plans to extend free school meals uh, to all years in, in primary school right throughout the year, including school holidays. If we are re-elected in the election in May, we have taken steps throughout the pandemic to put extra money into the pockets of those on the lowest income uh, incomes, and we will continue to look uh, to do that. Housing, uh, we, uh, through our affordable housing programme, of course, have uh, built uh, record or almost uh, record numbers uh, of new houses to try to deal with some of the pressures on uh, housing availability. So across all of these things, I do think the Scottish Government and all of these things I've spoken about, I think, puts us in a, a unique position in terms of the UK. The, the Scottish Child Payment, for example, doesn't exist in any other UK uh, nation. I hope that in future years it might. So we are taking action uh, to back up those targets. But, and this is a big but that I think uh, we all have to consider, we need to do more. We know that poverty, child poverty in particular, is too high. Um, and we know that the pandemic uh, and the inequalities that it has both exposed and exacerbated run the risk of, of making that problem worse. So we've all got to challenge ourselves to do more. I know the Scottish Government and my party, in terms of setting out plans for the next uh, session of Parliament, are absolutely focused on doing that. And I hope that is true of parties across the chamber. Thank you. Question number five, Christine Graham. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government is considering children returning to full-time education during part of the traditional summer holiday period. First Minister. Uh, there are no plans to take a blanket approach uh, to increasing pupils' learning time or the intensity of learning time. Individual schools will work with pupils, as they do every year, to identify uh, ways to supplement learning as appropriate. And we've encouraged schools and local authorities to target support where it's most needed, uh, including tutoring, if required. In addition, eSchool will also be providing an Easter senior phase study support programme that will begin in April. And they are currently uh, gathering input from learners to, to best design uh, that programme. Uh, teachers are contracted to work 195 days a year. Any additional cover for summer holidays would obviously need to be agreed um, and on a voluntary basis. But I think what should be at the heart of this are the needs of children. Children have lost a lot of education and it's really important that we support them to make that up. But children have been affected in a, a whole plethora of ways and I think it is the whole well-being of children that we need to have in mind as we go through the rest of the pandemic and into the recovery phase. Christine Graham. I thank the First Minister for her answer. Can I put on record, Presiding Officer, my thanks to all the staff in our schools for all they have done for our children and grandchildren during this very long pandemic. I listened to the First Minister, but does the First Minister agree with me, as I think she does, that school is so much more than the three R's to use old-fashioned shorthand, but so important for that well-being and social development of our children, and a version of summer school might provide that which has been lost over these months? First Minister. Yeah, I mean, I think all of these things we should uh, properly consider. There is a, a big job of work to be done here, and it is one that's not going to be completed quickly to make sure that the impact on our young people here does not turn into a long-term impact that saddles them for the rest of their lives. And that is, yes, about making sure that we help them make up lost education and, and lost learning time, but also that we support them to deal with the, the wider impacts of this, the separation from their friends, the the, the worry and anxiety that COVID has brought to their parents, no doubt, and to them as well. The long periods of time without seeing close relatives, like grandparents, that is all having, I think, a deep emotional impact on our young people. And I think whatever we do in the months uh, and perhaps years to come has to take account of recovery in the widest sense, so that whatever else happens or doesn't happen here, this generation of young people uh, do not pay that life at uh, long price for the hopefully once in a century pandemic that we are uh, unfortunate enough to be living through. Thank you. Question number six, Jamie Halcrow-Johnson. 
to ask the First Minister when projects to dual the A9 and A96 roads are expected to be completed. First Minister. Well, we continue to take forward plans to dual the A9 and the A96, uh, despite the 5% cut to Scotland's capital budget as a result of Westminster budget decisions. We have completed the first section of the A9 with construction well underway on the second, and uh, the project is expected to open to traffic in the winter of this year. The design and development process has been protracted, obviously, by the impacts of COVID, but also quite rightly in ensuring that the statutory process concludes with local communities having their say and any objections uh, as far as possible being resolved. Uh, design work is also well underway in dueling the A96. This is a very significant undertaking which requires very careful in-depth planning and design to ensure that we deliver the right schemes and keep impacts on the environment to the minimum. Uh, once the statutory process concludes, a timetable for progress can be set. Jimmy Harker Johnson. The pledges to complete work by 2025 and 2030 for the A9 and A96 respectively have been described as ambitious. And of the 11 sections of road under the A9 programme, which started in 2011, only one has been completed so far, with only one other even under con construction. And none of the work on the A96 has started. And these projects are vital for communities across my region, both for accessibility and for safety with the Institute of Advanced Motorists saying that failure to complete the project will, and I quote, cost lives as well as stunting the local economy. So will the First Minister again reassure my constituents in the Highlands and Islands that the Scottish Government is committed to completing both projects in full and within the original target timescales, and will she commit to providing delivery timescales for the remaining sections of the A9 and for the A96? First Minister. Uh, I set out both the fact, and I agree that the proposals are ambitious, but I've set out progress and our intentions with those. I'll ask the Transport Secretary to write in more detail, just uh, setting out the, the future projections. Uh, with projects like this, there are complex and, as everybody knows, at times lengthy planning and statutory processes that have to be undertaken, uh, not least because it is really important local uh, residents and people get the chance to have their say on the design um, and that any objections or concerns are, are taken into account and, where possible, addressed. It clearly, as is the case on almost every facet of life right now, COVID has had an impact on all of this and we will need to consider exactly what that impact will be going forward. Uh, but I've set out the significant progress, uh, particularly on the A9 and uh, where the A96 plans are and will continue to progress these as quickly as possible. Thank you. Question 7. Ian Gray. To ask the First Minister how far people should be expected to travel to attend a vaccination appointment at a COVID-19 vaccination hub. First Minister. Well, every effort has been and will continue to be made to minimise uh, travel times and distances to vaccination centres where that is possible. I know that some residents in uh, areas like East Lothian uh, have had to travel to central Edinburgh locations and for some people in some parts of East Lothian that might be a distance of around uh, 35 uh, miles. Uh, however, there is a new vaccination centre at Queen Margaret University in Musselburgh which has opened I think uh, today um, that will be significantly closer and will carry out 4,000 vaccinations in the next week. Um, if someone is offered an appointment at a location that isn't suitable for them due to mobility or an underlying condition or any other factor, uh, an alternative location will, wherever possible, be offered and the national booking line is in place for rescheduling appointments and calls to the line can be passed to NHS Lothian's local call handlers to arrange appointments locally. Ian Gray. Well, people understand how big a challenge this programme is, and they do appreciate the efforts of those who are delivering it. And they are willing to go to great lengths to be vaccinated, but the lengths they're being asked to go to are rather more than the First Minister appears to believe. In East Lothian, many constituents who live in Dunbar or North Berwick are being asked to travel past not one, but two vaccination hubs in East Lothian to go, yes, to the Edinburgh Conference Centre, or even worse, the Royal Highland Showground. That's a round trip of around 80 miles, two or three bus journeys, a return taxi fare of about £120. Now, if they do phone the helpline, they are routinely and repeatedly told nothing can be done, no closer appointments are available. Meanwhile, they hear stories of Midlothian residents being sent to Haddington in East Lothian for their vaccination. And we have the whole rollout of second doses still to come. Will the First Minister intervene and sort this out? First Minister. Uh, we will continue to try to get the right balance between local accessibility and speed of the programme. 
Um, rightly, we have been under pressure to speed up the programme, uh, notwithstanding the reasons for the phasing of it in the, the early days. The, the programme is now motoring. But yes, I appreciate that some people, particularly as we go down the age groups, will be asked to travel a, a bit further, but we will be as flexible. Local uh, health boards will be as flexible as possible, and health and social care partnerships should also be offering to help with transport where uh, somebody has to travel a bit more. So the new centre in Musselboro that I spoke about, that is uh, exactly an example of trying to make this more accessible. Um, this is never going to be perfect for people because we are trying to vaccinate the entire adult population as quickly as possible and certainly most of the people who are contacting me recognize that uh, but equally we recognize that we need to really make sure that people are not being asked to travel inordinate uh, distances or being put in positions where it is genuinely impractical for them to do it and that's where the flexibility and the input of local health boards is really important so we continue to try to get this as right as we can but you know let me just end this answer by saying this program is going really well notwithstanding some of the the, the, the issues we see and will no doubt continue to see in some areas with a programme of this scale, but there are people right across the country working so hard to get through people as quickly as possible. And of course, people enthusiastically turning up for their appointments is also a critical part of the success so far. Thank you. We'll turn now to supplementary questions. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Liam Kerr. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Officer, I have been contacted by a number of police officers locally who feel that uh, they could or should be prioritised when it comes to receiving the COVID vaccine. And I've spoken to some officers in particular who have had to self-isolate either three or four times since last March. Can the First Minister give any details of discussions the Scottish Government has had with the GCBI regarding prioritising certain professions like police officers and also teachers who receive the vaccine first when the initial prioritisation list is completed? First Minister. Well, I have set out the some of the issues that we're grappling with here before, and uh, I know people understand these. In the early phase of this vaccination programme, we have limited supplies, and therefore we have to prioritise uh, where those supplies go first. And instead of uh, government doing that, uh, based on our own judgments, we have, as indeed we always do with issues around vaccination and immunisation, taken the clinical expert advice of the JCVI, who have uh, asked us to prioritise based on uh, the, the order of people uh, in clinical need and at greatest risk of, of becoming seriously ill and dying. That's the list we're working through right now. Uh, we hope to have completed uh, that initial list by the early part of, of May. Uh, to recap, that is everybody above the age of 50 and everybody of any age, uh, any adult of any age, with underlying health conditions. There will be some police officers included in that, just as there will be some teachers included in that. But as we are with limited supplies going through this early phase, every time we were to decide to prioritise with greater priority one group of people, we would have to deprioritise another group and that would be a group that the JCVI have considered is more clinically at risk. And I don't think that would ethically be the right thing to do. However, as we get uh, to the point where uh, we are getting to the end of that list, uh, we will, of course, be thinking about the order in which we vaccinate the rest of the adult population. The JCVI are currently considering what advice they might give on prioritisation in the second phase. We hope to receive that in the near future. And part of their consideration will be on whether there should be occupational prioritisation for healthy individuals from 16 to 50, uh, subject, of course, to latest data on vaccine safety and effectiveness. So when we have that advice, we will set that out to Parliament and also set out the decisions that we will take on the basis of it. Thank you. Liam Kerr, before when Neil Findlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A related question, First Minister, if I may. Offshore medics are on the front line in the battle against COVID, helping to save lives on board oil platforms, whilst the oil, offshore oil and gas workforce work tirelessly to protect security of supply throughout the pandemic. So is the First Minister able to give similar comfort as to whether offshore medics and offshore workers should receive the vaccination as a priority in phase two to keep these critical workers safe? First Minister. Well, that will depend on the advice the JCVI uh, gives us and the JCVI will give the same advice to Scotland, England, Wales and Northern Ireland and uh, if, if the past is anything to go by all governments will accept that advice. So I cannot say that with certainty right now because that would be preempting the clinical expert advice uh, that we will give should the JCVI consider that it is appropriate to give us advice on the prioritisation 
of the, the rest of the adult population. This will be done as quickly as possible. It will be done on the basis of the best clinical advice and in the order of priority that is uh, most likely to reduce serious illness and cut the number of people dying uh, from this virus. I think that's the right way to go. I understand that everybody, all of us, with, virtually without exception, want to get vaccinated yesterday, uh, but we have to do this methodically and in line with advice, and that's what we will continue to do. Thank you. Neil Findlay to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Yeah, this week, Tesco is paying a five billion dividend to shareholders, whilst cutting between three and 13,000 a year from key workers at the Livingston Distribution Centre and four other locations. Does the First Minister agree with me that this sickening corporate greed exemplifies everything that is wrong with un unregulated free market capitalism? And will she join me in calling on Tesco to withdraw the despicable fire and rehire threat. First Minister. I would call on any employer to treat their staff fairly at all times, but particularly given the difficult circumstances everybody is living in and working in right now. And I'm not responsible for what Tesco decides to do in terms of payments, uh, dividend payments to shareholders or indeed its uh, hiring practices, but I have no hesitation in saying uh, that any employer that is treating workers unfairly uh, or against the, the principles of fair work right now um, should, should uh, you know, be asked to, to think again, and, and I'm happy to do that. Of course, we would have more ability to regulate some of these things in this parliament if these powers didn't lie at Westminster and instead lay here in this parliament. And uh, I know Neil Finlay is uh, not standing again at the election, but uh, notwithstanding that, hopefully he can be an advocate in favour of that in the future. Thank you. Ruth McGuire, to be followed by Brian Whittle. Ruth McGuire. Presiding officer, in challenging times, those in already vulnerable situations are often hit the hardest. Can I ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to support priority families identified in the Tackling Child Poverty Plan to improve their income prospects and to help protect them from the precarious situation they find themselves in at this difficult time? First Minister. Uh, supported by the Tackling Child Poverty Fund, we've invested uh, more than £7 million uh, in this year in the new Parental Employability Support Fund, uh, which is designed to help low-income parents, in particular from the priority family types identified in the delivery plan, uh, to progress into and then within employment. Uh, this year's draft budget confirms further funding of £5 million for this service and will shortly confirm details of additional funding to strengthen the support available to both disabled parents and young parents. Uh, this, of course, is in addition to the wide-ranging action we're taking through the delivery plan, including providing advice through the Money Talk team and directly boosting the incomes of households uh, for up to 163,000 children through the Scottish Child Payment. Thank you. Brian Whittle to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister what extra protections and testing can be put in place for those teachers who are currently looking after children with special needs, children who are vulnerable and the children of key workers? Because by the very nature of their jobs, they come into close contact with not just their charges, but also the parents of these children. And I'm sure the First Minister will agree that these, the work that these teachers are doing is essential, but also comes with an increased risk. First Minister. Of course, we are delivering asymptomatic testing uh, to schools, literally uh, that's in progress as we speak right now in advance of uh, some gradual phased return to school, we hope, although uh, that has to be confirmed uh, next week, uh, later on this month. Um, I'll happily take the issue away and have discussions about whether there is more we can do for the particular groups on top of that. But you know, there's no doubt testing has a key role to play here in trying to identify uh, cases of the virus and get people into isolation as quickly as possible. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Keith Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, while First Minister's questions has been in progress, the UK Government has announced an additional £3.5 billion for the removal of unsafe metal cladding from private buildings. Uh, given this announcement, I'm wondering if the First Minister could reflect on whether or not the Scottish Government will review the financial assistance it's made available for the removal of uh, such cladding, especially given the, the financial uh, uh, predicament that leaves many people. Thank you. First Minister. 
obviously I'm not going to comment on the announcement because I haven't heard the announcement because I've been standing here answering questions. I set out, um, I think last week or possibly the week before, at First Minister's questions, the work that the Scottish Government is doing to determine how best we target funding to help those uh, most in need of help uh, in this situation. I have uh, constituents of my own who are affected by this, so I know how uh, urgent that uh, is. But once I've had the opportunity to catch up on whatever has been announced today and what the implications might be for the Scottish Government decision-making, I'm happy to write to the member with an update. Thank you. Keith Brown to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. The First Minister will be aware that the Tory Government of Westminster are advertising jobs in the Cabinet Office's Union Unit, where knowledge of Scottish issues is only deemed desirable. Does the First Minister agree that this unit is in no more than a costly, flag-waving exercise and an outrageous waste of taxpayers' money? First Minister. Well, I suppose the UK government uh, asking for people uh, where knowledge of Scotland is desirable, you could say is a step in the right direction, because uh, there's no evidence they have insisted on that at any point in, in the past. But doesn't it say at all, recruiting people in a so-called union unit, that I understand uh, they've said that it's not essential to have knowledge of Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. Uh, so complete uh, disinterest in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland perhaps might just sum up the union uh, pretty perfectly. Um, but the most interesting thing about this union unit, as far as I can see, I mean, if it was the Scottish Government, of course, uh, having a, an independence unit in this way, we'd have howls of protest from the Conservatives. But it's, it's all this effort that's been put into fighting in a referendum campaign that they say is never, ever going to happen. It's a bit odd, that. So what I'm saying to people is, let's get through COVID. I'm focused on COVID right now, getting this country through COVID. And then post-pandemic, let's have this debate properly. And here's an idea. Let's allow the people of Scotland to decide their own future. Alistair Hamilton, to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. On Friday morning, I hosted a virtual coffee morning for over 50 new parents in my constituency. From the start, it became clear just how much strain these people are under, especially the mums, with many reduced to tears as they shared their stories. In England, the extended household policy has been expanded to allow parents with babies under the age of one to bubble up with another household of new parents. There is no such provision in Scotland. Good parental mental health is a matter of profound importance for the well-being and the development of young babies. And with the possibility of several more months of lockdown still ahead of them, we just need to give these mums and dads a bit of hope and the society of their peers. So can I ask, will the First Minister now follow England and allow these parents to bubble up with each other for support? Uh, we'll always consider what more we can do to ease the, the pressure that people, I think particularly parents, are living under. Of course, uh, Scotland, unlike England, uh, have uh, for some time now excluded children under 11 from the, the limits uh, that we Im impose um, in, in terms of people meeting up uh, and, and such like. And of course, there is already the extended household uh, concept in Scotland where single parents uh, with children under 18 can join another household. So there are arrangements in place, uh, but nobody, least of all me, underestimates the difficulties people are facing. And we will continue to consider every way in which we can make that uh, better. But we have to do that carefully. Um, you know, as I keep saying, uh, infection levels in Scotland are too high. They are coming down. But Infection levels in Scotland are lower than they are in England. So perhaps that suggests that the careful approach we're taking is not always the wrong one. But I do recognise the difficulties for particular groups of people, which is why we will always look to see what more we can do to ease up these restrictions where it is appropriate. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, only yesterday scientists from Harvard and University College London announced research findings that showed that fine particles from burning fossil fuels are responsible for up to one in six deaths in the UK pre-COVID-19. This is in addition to a study published a fortnight ago on accelerating global ice loss, which matches the worst case scenarios of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In view of this serious situation, will the government redouble its ongoing work in cooperation with other nations to avert catastrophic climate change? First Minister. Uh, yes, we absolutely will. We recognise, as I think uh, everybody does, that global cooperation is absolutely integral and essential to 
responding effectively to both the climate and the ecological crisis. Uh, we're already playing our part uh, at the end of last year. Of course, we updated the climate change plan with over 100 new policies that will help us achieve a just transition to net zero by 2045. And as the Climate Change Committee has noted, the Scottish economy has decarbonised more quickly than the rest of the UK and faster than any G20 economy since 2008. We also intend to use the opportunity of COP26 and a role uh, of co-chair of the Under Two Coalition to raise global ambition and drive forward tangible climate action across the world. Thank you. Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, the dedicated staff at Whitehill Community Centre in Hamilton had to throw out 14 vials of the Pfizer vaccine, which had been held at a lower temperature for more than five days because appointment vac vacancies made centrally had not been filled. Each vial has 67 jabs, hence 84 to 98 people were deprived of this life-saving vaccine. That's just one centre in Lanarkshire. There are similar experiences Scotland-wide. Will the First Minister please provide clear messaging that those in the shielding and relevant, relevant age groups can check the national helpline to confirm their appointment date and thereafter check the availability of short notice, that day or next usually, appointment vacancies to ensure not a single drop of this precious vaccine is squandered, that the maximum number of people are vaccinated each day and more people can then move up the queue. First Minister. Well, can I say first of all, just for the reassurance of anybody watching this uh, right now, nobody is going to be deprived of their vaccination. Every adult in Scotland uh, will be offered this vaccination and I hope uh, we see, as we have done in the early groups, significant numbers of people coming forward to get uh, the vaccination. Uh, wastage is minimised. The, the wastage rates of uh, this vaccine so far are very low um, and we want to get them lower still. They are well below the, the 5% sort of international uh, figure that is often used uh, for planning uh, assumptions when uh, designing programmes like this. I cannot ever, and I think most people using common sense would realise why I stand here and say that there will not be wastage of a single drop because there are things that happen in the distribution and the administering of vaccines sometimes that, that make that impossible. Uh, but there will be efforts, and I know those administering this programme are working hard literally every hour of every day to minimise uh, the wastage uh, to the, the absolute lowest levels. Health boards have standby lists, so if there are appointments that are not filled, uh, they will. And, you know, I, as I'm sure others will have had emails from people who have had very short notice uh, messages to ask if they can come for an appointment uh, that same day, maybe a couple of hours uh, hence. Some people think that's great. Others, you know, are less happy with that. So these uh, systems are in place. Overall, I'm, I'm never going to stand here and say that in a, a, a programme of this scale, this is the biggest uh, peacetime logistical exercise that we've ever undertaken in Scotland. The same is true of the other uh, UK nations. It is not going to be the case that everything, every single day is perfect, that there are no glitches, that there are no things that go wrong. And when they do, as happened in Fife uh, this week, we have to take action quickly to resolve them and we must keep wastage to an absolute minimum. But right now, this is a programme going better than I could have dared hope uh, at this stage. Yesterday's uh, daily number of, of vaccinations, the one that was uh, reported yesterday, uh, proportionately in terms of vaccines per million of the population, was the highest achieved so far uh, on a single day by any, uh, UK, uh, by I think uh, certainly between Scotland uh, and England. Uh, so, and it was our highest daily total so far. Today, in the face of some of the most severe weather conditions we've had in many years, uh, we've had our second highest daily total. So this programme is going well and we will continue on a daily basis to resolve as quickly as we can any of the issues that arise, including the ones that the member has highlighted. Rhoda Grant to be followed by Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister is aware that businesses received support based on rateable value. Maritime businesses don't have a rateable value, but do have similar costs such as birthing dues, loans and rental payments, and yet they have received no help. They might qualify for Council's discretionary payments, but that is inadequate to meet their needs and a fraction 
of what their land-based equivalents received. Will she undertake to ensure that they get an equivalent level of support? First Minister. I'll ask the Finance Secretary to look at the particular uh, case uh, or sector uh, that the member is highlighting and uh, consider whether there is more action we can take. Obviously, with any system of financial support, we need some uh, system to base eligibility on and rateable value, I think, is, is the best one. It's not perfect, but the best one uh, that we can have so far. But we have recognised uh, that some will fall through the cracks in that, which is why other sectoral schemes have been put in place. And of course, councils have been given money and indeed the Finance Secretary has recently indicated an increase in that money uh, to use at their discretion for businesses that don't fulfil the criteria of any of the other schemes. So we will continue to look to see what more we can do and I'll ask the Finance Secretary to respond to the member when she's had an opportunity to look particularly at the marine sector. And Maureen Watt. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Following on from Jamie Harker Johnson's question earlier, I'm pleased to say that here that he's committing the Tories to uh, duelling the A9 and the A96. He might want to tell his colleague Peter Chapman, who's against that, but perhaps there's a split in the Tories. But Parliament will remember the Tories also previously pledging to add a lane to the M8, which would strip funding from projects like the A9 and the A96. Does the FM agree that there is either another, this is another demonstration of Tory hypocrisy or simply confirmation that they believe there's a magic money tree from which you can spend cash twice? Well, I certainly agree that looking for any consistency on the part of the Conservatives uh, would be much harder than looking for the proverbial needle in the, the haystack. It's pretty much non-existent. Um, when you're uh, in the position, of course, of having to take these decisions, it's important to do it properly, to give proper consideration and to make sure the money is there to fund uh, the commitments that we're making. Uh, that's why the new uh, National Transport Strategy, which was published in February last year, has set the priorities and outcomes that we seek for transport. Uh, the second strategic transport project review is currently identifying the strategic transport interventions uh, required to provide us with a network fit for the 21st century uh, and in a post-COVID world, uh, of course, which locks in the positive benefits and travel behaviours of individuals. So we will continue to do that uh, hard, difficult but necessary uh, work uh, and leave the Conservatives to continue to tie themselves in the knots that they so often do. <laughs> Thank you very much, colleagues. That concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to suspend and resume at 2.30 with a debate on the Crown Office. Parliament is suspended.